Condor, and Monroe Maybon. Applause. Each candidate will be allowed 60 seconds for opening and closing statements and 90 seconds for the question and answer session. Candidates, there will be a timer on the screen showing how much time is left for your comments. Please keep an eye on this to stay within your allotted time frame. Let's begin with the opening statements in descending order in alphabetical order by last name, Mr. Condor, if you please. Thank you, Bob. I first wanna thank the chamber for inviting us to speak with you this morning. Most of you know me, but for those that don't, my name is Chuck Condor, and I've had the honor of serving as the Ward 4 member of our seven member city council for the past four years. My life has been committed to public service, including 20 years as an Air Force officer and 10 years as an assistant for former Ward 5 council member Chris MacArthur. In the many years I have worked in City Hall, I have gained a great amount of knowledge. Along with the relationships I built and continue to have within City Hall, this allows me to be the most effective council member possible. I have kept my promises to fight against higher taxes and fees, to not waste our hard working taxpayers money. I continue to fight to ensure Riverside remains a safe community in which to work in, live in and raise our children in. I have worked to help businesses and create new jobs for a growing Riverside. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Condor. Mr. Maybone, welcome and the floor is yours. Yes, good morning. Riverside deserves an effective and responsive advocate to all of its residents. As a council member, I will work hard to responsibly manage our tax dollars, increase transparency, and ensure our city recover from the pandemic and the challenges to come. Addressing the issues here in Ward 4 specifically, I'm very much concerned about the quality of life and restoration of small businesses on a citywide level, oh, ensuring that our city receive its fair share of the compensation from Recover America. I'm the only candidate, only person who has experience on a city, county, state, and federal level to move our city forward. I'm Monroe Maybond, and I'm here to work for you. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Maybond. At this time, the candidates will answer questions composed by the chamber. Each candidate will have the opportunity to answer the same question with 90 seconds to complete their statement. First question is gonna to go to you, Mr. Maybone. Is the California Air Resources Board, Southern California headquarters is set to open this year. Yay. <laughs> what ideas do you have to leverage this facility to bring new investments into Riverside? Well, my family has a history in Ward 2 and that facility is opening up in Ward 2 along the university corridor. It's an opportunity to expand upon some of the progress that has already began in that area, looking at uh, Park Avenue and Victoria and some of the development that has gone in, on in that area. We need to make Riverside more attractive to business. I am a business person. I have run my own business. I still have interest in, in an accounting firm that my son is running now in Texas. I do not believe in punishing capitalists because they make a profit, but I'm looking for ways to make Riverside more attractive through the three universities and the outstanding nursing school that we have in, our, in, in Riverside Community College. Riverside has the potential of being a magnet for business and progress in Southern California. And I'm here to bring the background experience and training that I have in the commercial field to do just that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maybon. Mr. Condor. Thank you, Bob. First of all, bringing CARB here to Riverside was a, a great stroke of uh, hard work and uh, this council did a good job in assisting that to happen. It's, uh, it's located in Ward 2, but it's gonna affect us citywide. In, in the general area of, of Ward 2 and the CARB facility, this council is gonna need to work with the Ward 2 council member to improve uh, university to make that an attractive place for the workers of CARB to go to before, after, during work. And we need to work with CARB and, and join the synergy of the great universities that we have in this city to get them to work together. Because unless we continue to find good high paying jobs for our youth, they're gonna continue to leave Riverside and we're gonna have that drain brain going on. And we just can't have that. CARB brings a lot of smart and great jobs here and having it work within the system of the city, within our universities, with our city council helping out, with our business councils from the Chamber of Commerce, 
you're going to see some great things happen along not only that Ward 2 corridor, but it's going to flow with other areas of the city of Riverside. All right. Thank you, Mr. Condor. Now for question number two. City Council is considering guidelines on how to grant preference to local contractors and vendors that bid on city owned land. What types of policies would you like to see included as part of the guidelines? And we will begin with you, Mr. Condor. Having local businesses have a better shot at anything we do in the city is, is, is gonna help our, our city businesses and our people here. Um, we have been discussing widely about what these guidelines could be. Should it be an extra you know, percentage point if they're doing a scoring for an RFQ or an RFP? Um, it's still getting looked at, but ensuring that our local businesses, when our business people take their time, their energy, their money, and put their life into the city of Riverside, and they apply for a job here, a business job here to maybe pave a road or construct a building, they need to know that they've got a fair and equal shot with these very large companies that can come in and often underbid them because they have the, uh, the, the, uh, the scale that they can do that for. We need to give our people here an advantage. It's just the right thing to do. And how can we ask a person to go become a businessman, join the chamber, open a business, put your life into that, hire people locally and not let them have a better shot at whatever they're applying for uh, on an RFQ, RFP or something to do in the city. So we need to make sure that they have that preferential treatment uh, legally and, uh, and morally, uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. All right, thank you, Mr. Condor. Uh, Mr. Maybon, your turn. Yes, as a business person, not only a business person, but as a business person who is also a business person who is classified and certified as a licensed disabled veteran business person. I'm very familiar with RFPs and requests for RFPs. My concern is not necessarily the lowest bid, but the quality of service that that company is going to bring. And most of all, most important, is looking at companies here in Riverside. I cannot see going to Orange County or Irvine and bringing in some company because they're a large mega corporation uh, to do uh, work in Riverside just because they submitted the lowest bid. I'm concerned about the quality of work but most of all, priority should be given to businesses here in Riverside. There's a concept in the ward concept of home rule. And let's look at home rule throughout the city. And what are we doing in terms of home rule and attracting and building up the businesses here in Riverside? Recently, our son took my wife and I out to dinner. We had to go to Rancho Cucamonga. I want businesses and services to be right here in Riverside, whether it's paving roads or constructing homes. We want to look at Riverside first. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Maybon. And now onto question three, salaries, benefits, and pension costs for staff account for more than 85% of the city's budget. Meanwhile, the city is projecting a growing budget deficit in the coming years what can be done to provide greater control over these costs? And Mr. Condor, we'll begin with you. You know, it has been a challenge from the very beginning of my time working in City Hall, seeing the percentage of city's funding from general fund that goes to uh, personnel costs. Uh, it, it's, it's been weighing heavily on everybody on the council, and we need to look at not only making sure that we are giving our employees a fair wage. But we've got to look at ways of reducing the cost to the city. And one way, of course, is, is outsourcing, going to the business world. The business world is the one that creates jobs. We need to outsource to the business world. Uh, the city, our main function is to provide for the safety and the security of our residents. There are certain things the city does now that it really shouldn't be doing. It should be in the hands of the private industry, of the business community. And we need to look at outsourcing and reducing the size of government, reducing our, our personnel costs. And we also have to look at using technology. Technology, as we've seen in this last year, as we're doing now, I mean, I can't give my hug to Elba because I'm not there. We're using technology to get a lot of things done. So we can reduce possibly the footprint of the city by using more technology to get people to work at home, not needing as much space, reduce our footprint and our overall costs. 
but we've got to take this. We've got to remain solvent and to attract business to Riverside. And the salaries and the cost pension costs are one that are really, really damaging us. Thank you, Mr. Maybach. Yes, good morning. Anyone who have had the opportunity to meet me and know me for more than 10 minutes know that I'm a doting grandfather. Recently, one of our grandsons, while I was transporting him to football practice, asked me, he said, Grandpa, are you and Grandma millionaires? No, we're not, in answer to the question. But the very first business I started was as a tax preparer that developed into an accounting firm that is now being run in Dallas, Texas by our son and daughter-in-law who are both CPAs. We've learned the importance of budgeting and prioritizing budgets and looking forward to maintaining those budgets and having audit systems to make sure that we're spending money properly. It has been said that an individual's past performance is the best indicator of a person's future performance. My past performance has been a person who not only has experience in law, but has some knowledge of accounting and have three CPAs in my family, our sibling, our children, who uh, we can turn to for advice and expertise. That's how we have maintained a wonderful, reasonable lifestyle. And that's the talent and skills that I bring to Riverside. I came up under Proposition 13. I know how to manage more with less. And that's what I bring to the city council. Thank you. Thank you. Now on to question four. Under the Prada lawsuit, Riverside will lose 30 to 40 million annually if the general fund transfer is eliminated. Do you think the general fund transfer should continue? You can explain your position. And we're gonna start with Mr. Condor. Oh, okay. Um, it's no secret, I have been against the GFT for many years in its current form. I've used statements that this is crack to the addict. We have to find a way to wean ourselves off of GFT. In the 10 years I worked with Councilman MacArthur and in my own four years, we've sat in so many meetings where, you know, Chris was great at it. He'd ask, we, do we need that? We can't afford that. And the answer always was, don't worry about it. They're going to get the GFT to pay for it. That's how you get irresponsible spending and that's how you get into financial difficulties. We've got to find a way to wean ourselves off. You know, let's say in 2022's budget, we take the 11.5%. In 24, we knock it down a point and a half and go to 10% and see how that works. And uh, 26, we go down to eight and a half percent. Wean ourselves down, find that balance. We're doing things with, you know, we, we passed measure Z, you know, $1 billion plus tax to handle a lot of the things that are now, we're saying we can't afford. Uh, Measure Z was there for it. GFT needs to be looked at, it needs to be weaned down. When I write my statement, my check to you know, RPU every, every month, I write it for clean water and reliable uh, electricity. I don't write it for air conditioners or sidewalk repairs. That's general fund money. RPU money needs to stay within RPU and the GFT needs to be weaned down slowly until we find that proper balance because it's not there right now, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Condor. And Mr. Avon, general fund transfer, your position. Yes, I've, I've had an opportunity to work in the metropolitan area that has its own uh, utility services, the Department of Water and Power in Los Angeles. I have a great deal of experience there. In fact, a family member, my wife worked there for many of years and so I have a little knowledge and understanding about uh, a municipality's ability to raise funds through utilities and resources. You know, it, it's very difficult for me, maybe because of my status as an attorney to talk about matters that are pending litigation or that has not been completely resolved in the litigation form. Uh, I support uh, the rule of law and let the court do this, this thing. But I believe, again, as I talked about home rule, that we elect people to properly manage our budget and resources and engage in activity that would not cause liability. I'm very much concerned, and I realize that we need funds for our public safety and response to this pandemic that we're coming out of, and to look at a reasonable point. I cannot categorically say, oh yes, let's do away with uh, the, the, the transfer of fund and put it back, no. Let's look for a reasonable solution that is within ethical and legal guidelines to move forward and enhance and improve our city and keep our taxes down. I'm very much concerned. I do not support uh, some of the discussions about taxes on cooperation. So let's look at that and come with a thorough uh, examination to a reasonable solution. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Mabon. Now to question five. Encroachment around March Air Reserve Base is one of the biggest threats to the ec significant economic positive impact it brings to our region, which totals about $600 million each year. What would you do to safeguard its presence in the community? Mr. Mabon, we'll bring it back to you first. I'm very much concerned about the development around that area. Uh, my wife complains. Uh, we went to uh, a, a visit a friend in a neighboring city and I drove her sedan. I normally drive a truck. And after going over the road, she said, if you go back to visit your friend again, you can no longer drive my car. We have development in that area where individuals are supposedly going on to the 215 freeway, but they're coming down, going down Van Buren to get on the 91. I'm very much concerned about what occurred in Sycamore Canyon, where you had the council person for that area voting against a warehouse that was developed in Sycamore Canyon that had an impact upon property value, but yet without any consideration from the other council members as to the impact that that warehouse would have on that community. So I'm, I'm very much concerned about the proliferation of warehouses, how it impact our, our property value. Uh, I want to know what benefits are we getting from the Meridian campuses that is going to Riverside? We need more of a say on the joint powers in addressing those issues and slowing and have a reasonable development of warehouses in that area and the impact that it's going to have on property value and the quality of life, and particularly emissions from those trucks and vehicles coming through the area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maybon. Mr. Condor. Thank you, Bob. Among my many responsibilities, I've been a commissioner on the Joint Powers Authority since January of 2020. And I've been assigned and been working with March Air Reserve Base since 1986. I'm concerned about the encroachment around that. And I work daily, daily with people from the base and the JPA to ensure that we're, we're protecting the base the best we can. Uh, the JPA is under congressional mandate to replace jobs. And they were given a certain amount of land and we got to make sure it's used properly. There's a, a very, very large uh, property now being built there. And I went straight to, I went to the pilots of the base and I said, is this going to affect you? And their answer was not its location, but there's some issues with the lighting. So we went back to the company and worked with them on that. March must remain. I've been working on uh, you know, papers and things from, for, for years to ensure March remains in its location because of its strategic value to the United States, to its economic value to this area. And I will continue to work both with General Coburn and her staff from the base with the chamber and their leadership, and also with the Joint Powers Commission to make sure that March does not appear ever again on a BRAC list because the March's continuation in this area is, is just vital, vital for the country, our security, and for the economic development of the areas of Riverside. Thank you, Mr. Condor. And on to question six. Several cities and counties across the state have implemented hazard pay mandates for grocery and other food workers during COVID. Do you think there is a need for hazard pay now that businesses are reopening and the end of COVID-19 is on the horizon? And we will begin with you, Mr. Condor. Thank you, Bob. Government does not belong in mandating this kind of salary. That's between the company and their employees. Secondly, this is the way that they try to, to try to separate us. Every man or woman that gets up in the morning and goes to work to support a family or the business, they're heroes, every one of them. Whether it is a, a car worker at Lexus that is working on make sure your car is safe so you can go to work, whether it's the pharmacist giving the medicines you might need to live and be able to go to work, whether it's the clothier that is getting you the clothing you need, everybody that works is a damn hero. And trying to separate us is wrong. Um, we need to make sure that people are safe, and we have. We've put out the rules and regulations, followed those from the county and the state. And I just think that saying that, well, because of food workers or frontline workers, what about hospital workers? What about the utilities people that are out there making sure we have the water and power? This is wrong trying to get government involved in this. Plus, it takes away money that could go to other programs that have equal or higher needs. So. I would absolutely vote not to have the government do this kind of work. It's not our place, not our place. That is between the employer and the employees. So that's an easy one. I will vote no if that comes to the Riverside City Council. Thank you, Mr. Condor. Mr. Maybone. Yes, 
I am a cart carrying certified disabled Vietnam era combat veteran. I am a retiree of police services for more than 47 years. I've been in firefights. I've been exposed to danger. But our healthcare workers and those who are responding to COVID-19 have experienced an enemy and danger greater than any that I've ever faced. During the height of the pandemic and the sacrifices that were made, yes, I support additional pay and compensation for the hazards that they're exposed to. Now that we're coming out of this pandemic and there's light at the end of the tunnel, we need to reassess that possibility of whether or not that should be kept in place. But we're very much be concerned about Kroger, Food for Less, and Ralph's that are closing their doors. I shuddered at the thought of the Ralph's in Canyon Crest because it has an impact not only on, on Ward 2, but throughout the city and any other business that might close in our area as a result of that. I will give careful consideration and give a reasonable balanced response to that issue. I cannot carte blanche say, I'm gonna throw out the baby with the bathwater. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maybon. Now to question seven. The issue of homelessness and vagrancy has recently become a serious public safety concern. What recommendations do you have to address homelessness across the city? And back to you, Mr. Mabel. Yes. Yesterday, the city of Los Angeles has dedicated close to uh, actually a billion dollars to address homeless issues. Our mayor has said, let's put the river back in Riverside. Many people are finding encampments down in the river bottom because it is a safe haven. Homelessness is something that we need to address and we need to address it immediately. And we need to tap into the $3.2 billion that is coming to California for uh, relief from COVID. Some of that money can go to address homelessness. Trailers on property that might be available from some of the faith-based communities that are already engaged in such activity. Tiny, tiny housing, uh, such as those that have been developed in and around the Grove Church. Uh, social uh, needs of those individuals who are homeless. One of the issues that have been identified in Los Angeles, just providing shelter alone is not sufficient. So yes, it is a serious problem. One size does not fit all. I have worked with Damien O'Farrell from the beginning of Path of Life, I have a relationship with our former mayor to go forward and deal with those issues. I'm the only person who have come out and let people know in the community that there is $9 million still available for rent for those individuals who are struggling. I will support a program that will address homelessness here in Riverside. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Maybaum. Mr. Condor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bob. First of all, throwing money at the problem is not the answer, and we've proven that. Back in October of 2019, I was finally, after 10 years, able to put together the Inland Empire Homeless Forum, where we had representatives from 20 cities in both Riverside and the San Bernardino counties. And we came together for an entire day at the convention center to talk about the regional approach needed to work homelessness. We solve homelessness. You can't get rid of it. It's always going to be there. We can do a better job of working the issues. He's going to be right back. Bob. We have another meeting in January of 20 where just the uh, city managers and the county executives got together to tighten down and focus on what we needed to get to. And then COVID hit. So our April 2020 and October 2020 meetings were canceled. Uh, we've started back up slowly. We had a virtual meeting back in March. We're hoping to have our fall meeting and get together and again, the synergy of our different agencies coming together. This council has done a lot. We've got the tiny houses on the pallet houses we put together. And I'm proud to say Ward 4 was the first ones to put the tiny houses up at the Grove. We understand that there's an issue out there and a problem. Riverside can't work it alone. We need to have the cooperation of everyone in the Inland Empire and we've begun that cooperation. Nobody else had done that. So we did that in October of 2019. And I'm proud of that forum and the people that came there. And we're going to continue and we're going to lead not only California, but the nation in our homelessness. 
some solutions. Thank you, Mr. Condor. Now on to question eight. Do you support giving the mayor a vote on city council items in exchange for eliminating the mayor's veto power? Explain your position and Mr. Condor, back to you. Thank you, Bob. Um, no, I do not support giving the mayor the vote. The mayor is the neutral party. The mayor represents everybody equally. And if the mayor starts taking sides, if the mayor starts getting involved, then she loses or he loses that, that neutrality. Um, the mayor speaks for the city of Riverside. The mayor, of course, has a very powerful tool in the veto power, which has been rarely used, but when it has, it's been properly used. And taking away that veto power is going to damage the way the city is set up. We're like the government, the council is, the mayor is the president, the council is the Congress, and the president can veto and send something back to Congress and the mayor can do that. The mayor needs to be that party that can talk about every part of the city equally, be that neutral party, work with the council to try to um, solve the issues. But no, the mayor needs to stay where the mayor's vote is only in tie breaking, only in the veto, and not give the mayor the vote to be part of the. Well, then you're going to have eight. Then you're going to have the possibility of having four and four. It's not going to work, ladies and gentlemen. It's worked well the way we are. The mayor needs to stay where the mayor's position is and not have the vote on the council. Thank you, Mr. Condor. Uh, Mr. Maybon. Yes, I must exercise some caution in some cases, some. Uh, uh, non-responsive uh, comments because I am a former member of the 2019 and 2020 Charter Review Committee. And I'm currently uh, serving on the Charter Review Committee that is going forward. We just recently, within the last week, received a letter from the Rain Cross Center asking for access and more uh, public exposure uh, to our meetings. One of the issues that came up and that, that sparked this issue is a question of giving the mayor to vote, will that give a particular ward uh, two votes as opposed to one? Uh, what is the best approach and solution? My experience having served when there was a municipal court as a judge pro tem on the Los Angeles Municipal Court uh, to not rush to judgment, but consider all the facts and evidence. Uh, as a party of that committee, I think my approach to this situation right now is to hear what the community, the Rain Cross Group and various other individuals have to say and make a recommendation to the city council that is within the ambit of the community demands and concern. I must remain impartial and open-minded as we go through this process to make a recommendation to the city council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maybon. Uh, now to question nine. The Riverside Auto Center in Lexus of Riverside is a top sales tax generator for the city and continues to grow exponentially. What actions would you take to assist with the continued growth and encourage additional sales at the center? And Mr. Maybaum, please begin. Yes, this past weekend, my wife and I had an opportunity to visit the Riverside Auto Center. Uh, looking at you know what's coming to Riverside, air quality, emissions, I, I grew up in a time when we still had incinerators in the backyard. Uh, I, I have experienced uh, respiratory problems as a result of smog in the air. Uh, so we went uh, to the auto center looking at electric vehicles and, and a further step towards uh, increasing and reducing our carbon footprint. I'm really impressed and I will do everything I can to bring uh, support for the Riverside Auto Center uh, as I said, uh, I do not believe that corporations should be punished for making a profit, but we need to bring business and revenue to Riverside. And one of the ways of doing that is increasing sales and bringing dollars and sales and purchasing opportunities to Riverside. Yes, I support 100% the Riverside Auto Center. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maybaugh. Your turn, Mr. Condor. Thanks, Bob. Well, I tell you, I have a lot of fun working with the Auto Deal Association, working with, with Alva and, and Adele at Lexus and Dave Crane, the president, and Dwayne Pratt and Steve Kingley and Marshall Gordon. The big thing first is the Adams Exchange. We've got to get that worked out so that they have great access to that auto center. 
We have to keep working to improve the look of it, trying to find ways to bury those power lines to make sure that it is an inviting area. I've worked to help change the zoning on some areas so that they can expand. The auto center is pinned in right now and they need storage for their cars. They can't get the, uh, the storage that they need. We need to help them with anything and everything for that place to be the best it can because it is our biggest tax generator. Try to make sure that the roads are, are, are kept up in good shape down there. I worked to get some of the parking areas so that we didn't have the trucks in the middle blocking off. We tried to find additional parking areas for the members that work at the stores so that they're available parking for the customers to come in and look and buy cars. The auto dealers are amazing. They put a lot of time and effort and money into the city. They are so generous to the city when asked. And uh, it's just a great joy to work with every one of them. They are very appreciative of the city of Riverside for their help. And together, that synergy with both of us, we got some great things in front of us with that auto center in the city of Riverside. Thank you, Mr. Condor. Now on to question 10. What are three ways in which the city of Riverside can incentivize or streamline development, incentivize or streamline development in Riverside. And back to you, Mr. Condor. Okay, so number one, we're already doing it in a sense that we've got the one-stop shop down on the third floor. It's a helpful way to have a person or a developer be able to come in and get everything done in one general area instead of running around different parts of the city. We need to use, a, we're using it well, trust me, but we need to use uh, technology better so that a developer can send his information to the city, the city can look it over and send it back so there's the, not a delay in time of it sitting in somebody's inbox or waiting for someone to drive down and get it and then get it to someone to sign it. Uh, it's, it's faster, we're at a technological stage now where we can reduce the timing. If it says it's gonna take you know, 10 working days, there's the ability now to, to get that done faster. And the final way is the most important way. We've got to communicate better with our developers. I get a lot of phone calls from developers asking for assistance and I'll go down to the third floor and I'll find the right person and say, well, this has been ready. Didn't they know? This, this communication issue, both back and forth. We've got to improve that. So it's, it's making the, the third floors a one-stop shop more effective, make it work better, find ways to improve a little bit every day get the technology involved so that people can get their plans back faster because they've got costs, big costs and waiting hurts them. And we've got to communicate better so we can keep businesses wanting to come and spend their money here in Riverside and not somewhere else. Thank you, Mr. Condor. Mr. Maybaum. Yes, there is $3.2 billion allocated from December that's going to the state of California to be disseminated throughout the city or i sorry, throughout the state of California. We need to be at the forefront of getting those monies and resources and not utilizing just all of our revenue here in Riverside to streamline, yes, some of the services that are being provided to the community, opening up better lines of communications when an individual called the city hall that they are referred to the proper and dedicated agencies that needs to be addressed. Providing not just policy statement, but personal service to individuals in our communities, such services as what I did in around John F. Kennedy Elementary School, opening up mitigation areas to provide a sidewalk to eliminate the number of traffic and cars that are coming to the area to cut down on a carbon footprint and make access to the school and transportation more accessible. Look at environmental studies and the trails, the walking trails where I caused trash cans and doggy bag to be placed out for the city we have to look at a policy statement and personal statement and service to the community. We have to be about the city of art and innovation to make it more attractive, easy access to programs and policies and permit, quality of life and public safety. Those are issues of concern to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mabon. Now on to our penultimate question. Riverside has been tasked with building 18,000 to 24,000 housing units in the coming years. At the same time, we need the infrastructure in place to support this housing growth, along with the creation of job centers. As a city council member, how do you plan to balance these priorities? Mr. Maybon, please begin. You know, I'm very much uh, concerned. Uh, my first uh, 
adventure into business world was in tax preparation and accounting. Next was real estate. I'm very much concerned about property value here in Riverside. Uh, I want the people to have input. I do not want to be in a situation of giving uh, the community two bad choices between a car wash and a 7-Eleven. But I want to be about communicating with the public and having and giving them an input as to what is going to be the development in their home, in their community, as far as increasing the property value here in Riverside. Cynthia and I are not going anywhere, regardless of what the future brings. We're going to be here in Riverside for the rest of our lives. The majority of our grandkids are here in Riverside. So we're not going any place. I'm concerned about the quality of life and things like what happened in Sycamore Canyon that has a direct impact on property value. I do not want to, and I'm gonna do everything in my power to ensure that property value for homeowners does not decline here in Riverside. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maybon. Mr. Condor, you're up. Thank you, Bob. It's more than just property values. It's the ability of the city to even handle these, these new numbers. And I'm disappointed that the random numbers that have been thrust upon Riverside weren't challenged a little harder by the proper uh, members of our city. When doing this, we don't work with our school board right now. You just cannot sit down and throw multi-level housing with many, many new people into an area without asking the school board, can your school even handle this new influx? Can the streets handle it? Um, can the water systems and the power systems handle this influx? We've approved these you know, use of additional housing units, the, the ADUs that are gonna go onto properties. Uh, we've got streets like the old wood streets that don't have the proper ability to park cars. They don't even have long driveways and garages in some locations. Uh, this is a very serious issue to the city of Riverside. It's affecting our quality of life. The state is thrust upon us without thinking about what it's gonna do to our people, our quality of life. So again, I wanna work so closely with Mr. Hunt, the president of the board and the rest of those board members to ensure that these numbers, where they're gonna put these houses are not going to seriously affect the ability of our schools to teach our children. And I wanna make sure that not only our, our streets don't remain clogged by all these new people and cars, but the water and power systems are not going to crash under the under the the extra effort of trying to handle all these people. All right, thank you, Mr. Condor. Now we have our final question: What is your opinion on allowing street vendors and food trucks within city limits? And we'll start with you, Mr. Maymo. You know, I'm very much concerned about uh, any activity that might create a, a traffic or crime problem in our community. I'm concerned most of all about public health and safety. What do we have in place to address to ensure that those vendors are maintaining proper sanitary procedures? And I don't want pop-ups on, on the weekend just coming out indiscriminately throughout the neighborhood. Regulation and enforcement, code enforcement regarding those activities need to be in place. I realize that it is a popular situation going on with food trucks, but I have a great deal of concern and I do not support uh, just without any regulations, individuals coming to a street corner and opening up a, a fruit stand or a beverage stand without the proper control and sanitary procedures involved. My partner for almost 20 years, wife worked for uh, the health department uh, in Los Angeles, and I gained some insight on what is required. And I understand the meaning when you walk into a restaurant and they have a certain A, B, or C rating. My wife will not go into a restaurant that does not have at least an A rating. We need those activities to be regulated and governed and to protect the public. It, it is a health concern, and I would make sure that occur. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maybon. Mr. Conner. Street vendors within our core of our downtown, within our core of our city, no. If you didn't get that, let me say it again. No, it doesn't belong. Go down to LA and see what a mess that's become. You see street vendors, there's no, there's no people out there taking care of watching what's going on. Um, you got people selling prescription drugs. You've got food out there that is spoiling in the sun. You have all kinds of activities going on. That's not what the downtown Riverside and our businesses deserve. 
Now, if you want to identify a lot someplace out on the fringes of the city uh, and you want to put uh, the vendors and, and food trucks there, that's fine. It's no different than my leaving City Hall and driving to Riverside Plaza to go to Iowa and pick a restaurant. If I want to drive to the lot where the vendors are, the street vendors and trucks, that's fine. But it doesn't belong in downtown Riverside. We don't have the personnel to properly go out there and administer those. And right now, there's just no way in heck that I want to see that occur in our downtown area. Um, it's just, we, the county can't handle it right now. Sure, here we go, grow the size of government, put more cost on the taxpayers. This is not right for here. We don't have the downtown population to handle this. This is not New York City where tens of thousands of people come out of a building at one time. Uh, we don't have the people to properly handle it. And you're gonna see a vote of no from this council member when it comes to the council to open it up citywide in our core downtown. Thank you, Mr. Condor. Well, this completes the question and answer segment of our forum. We will now have the candidates give a 60 second closing statement. This time we'll have our closing statements in reverse order of the opening statements, beginning with Mr. Maybon, you are up. Yes, thank you. You know, people have asked me, why? Why do I think a pastor should serve on the Riverside City Council? Well, my whole life has been committed to service. I served in the United States Army and was honorably discharged as a combat-related injury veteran. I served on the Los Angeles Police Department at a pivotal time when police departments had to begin to address racial inequities. I served as a state attorney in the reformation of our prison. And as I began to serve at Allen Chapel, I realized that my service to my congregation was best by addressing all of the needs. I love Riverside. That is why I'm running. My business motto was, we work for you. My motto as a city council person is, I work for you. I'm Monroe Maybon, and I am here to work for you and not special interests. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maybon. Mr. Condor, closing statement. Thank you. It's been my high honor to have served the people of Riverside. As the Ward 4 representative for the last four years, I have worked every issue that has arisen and continue to work within our budget constraints to support Ward 4 and the quality of life for every resident of Riverside. The safety of our citizens will remain my top priority. Riverside must be safe for everyone. We must continue to spend your tax dollars wisely and ensure the city of Riverside avoids bankruptcy and remains financially solvent to attract new businesses. We must fight to reopen Riverside now and get our people back to work. Finally, full transparency of your government is non-negotiable, and I will continue to work with every resident to ensure you have the confidence you deserve in knowing that City Hall is operating effectively for you. Effectively for you. My name is Chuck Condor, and I'm asking for your vote on January 8th. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you, Mr. Condor. That completes the formal portion of our candidate forum for Riverside City Council Ward 4. <laughs> Candidates, sincerely, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate hearing about your vision for Ward 4 and the City of Riverside. And thank you, Alexis of Riverside and Elba. Well, this concludes today's forum, but before we adjourn, I'd like to turn it over to Janet from our team for a couple of quick announcements. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our meeting this morning. I wanted to share a quick um, announcement about our events that are coming up. Tomorrow, we will be having our next virtual after hours business mixer. This is a complimentary event. The registration link is in the chat. It will be from 5 to 6 p.m. And we thank Altura Credit Union for sponsoring this event. Our next upcoming event on May 13th will be our virtual Good Morning Riverside. It will be featuring our keynote speaker, Jeffrey Wong, BDM, um, the Riverside County Public Health Officer, and it will be sponsored by Western Municipal Water District. And finally, we'll be having our 36th annual virtual award ceremony on Thursday, May 27th from 12 to 1 p.m. via Zoom, and we will be honoring our 2021 Athena Award recipient, Kathy Mahalik. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at jdoan at riversidechamber.com. Um, and thank you so much for attending this event, everyone.